Hello everyone, welcome to tonight's episode of The Good Guy Drinks Whiskey. Tonight's guest is Rachna Hukmani, who is the creator and founder of the Michelin Guide recommended multi-sensory whiskey tasting experience called Whiskey Stories. Um, you can check out her uh, her company online or go visit her in Brooklyn and uh, experience one of her la- large array of whiskey tasting experiences. Um, as always, tonight we are going to share three drams. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about Rashna's background in whiskey, her company Whiskey Stories, and much, much more. So without further ado, let me bring her on to the live stream. Thank you uh, for joining me tonight, taking the time out of your night and, uh, you know, just sh- sharing some whiskey with me. Thank you for inviting me. You know, uh, I love, I love these. You do them every Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah, typically. Yeah, it's usually on a Wednesday or Thursday, whenever uh, is more convenient for my guests is usually when I hold it. Uh, but yeah, I've been doing them every week for the last five or six months and it's been great just uh talking to people who love whiskey and people who just are getting into whiskey and uh and just meeting new people it's very cool yeah it's great what you're doing it's always really fun to watch yeah thank you i appreciate that um (laughs) and uh, i'm I'm looking forward to getting to know more about your whiskey background uh, whiskey stories your company um and and some more some other stuff but before we jump into that um, let's talk about the three whiskeys we picked out for tonight that we can uh, sh- sip on as we have our discussion. Um, and for people watching, I, I send my guests, uh, a, at least the whiskey uh, enthusiast guests, a list of my, my open bottles. And um, I let them pick three bottles that they have in common. So for tonight, we have the uh, Magic Cask, Compass Box Magic Cask, right? Mm-hmm. The Glen Scotia 18. Yes. Yes. Ooh, you have more than me in that one. Yeah, actually, I just opened this up last night. It was the first time <laughs> I ever had it, so this this will be a, a very new experience for me. I really and, love this, so I have, you know, hopefully you're yeah. not going to say bottoms up with the, the bottle kill with that. But, but. No, no, we'll let you savor that, those last few drops. And then, uh, of course, one of my favorites is the uh, Springbank yes, 10-year-old. Me too. Um, so in, in, uh, you know, with the three we have tonight, which one would you usually start off with, with these three particular whiskeys? Great question. I would start off with the Glen Scotia 18. Okay. Um, and then I would go to Springbank 10 and All I would right. save Magic Cask for last. All right. That's the order we will go in tonight then. That sounds perfect. Great. Um, Perfect. so let's, uh, let's pour that first, uh, dram for the night, the, the Glen Scotia 18. So what are your general thoughts about this whiskey? You know, um, I think when people think Campbelltown, they think, let me pour it. So I'm drinking with you and you're yes. not drinking alone. Um, did you pre-pour all of them or? I did pre-pour all of them. So I, I cheated. I'm sorry. I, no, uh, no, that's not cheating. It's a... <laughs> It's one of those discussions we can have, should we pre-pour or not, right? But Springbank. And yeah. Springbank, what I love about it is the oily texture and then mm-hmm. the different levels of peat that they play with, right? Yeah. So I like the Glen Scotia. It is a little different from that. Yes. And although the whole idea of sherry season does not that unique, mm-hmm. I like the way, you know, the, the water source and, and the temperature of Campbelltown, the way this does it, it brings in a really nice balance of fruity and floral, which yeah. I like. Yeah, you know. yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and Glen Scotia is clearly a very different whiskey from Springbank and Glen Guile. Um, and Glen Guile. You know, uh, and this was the first time, last night was the first time I poured it. I had a friend over and we shared it. And I wasn't immediately blown away by this, the Glen Scotia 18. It had this, for me, it had this like super ripe banana uh, fl- yeah. undertones to it that wasn't, that I wasn't quite used to. So I think this is one that'll grow on me over time. But on first attempt, it was just, it was, it was a good whiskey, but it didn't hit that, the level of, that I would expect from an 18 year old uh, you know, mix of sherry, bourbon cask whiskey. The, the thing about it is it's, it's not your typical 18 year old. It does look, taste a little younger, mm-hmm. you know, with that. I agree with that. And I personally uh, love bananas. Yeah. Uh, I eat one every day. So, you know, uh, it's good. I, like, I like the banana foster. It tastes a little bit like almonds too, mm-hmm. like candied almonds to me. So 
Although I don't have much of a sweet tooth, I like that. But when you spend time with it, you start to feel that sweetness dissipates quite a lot. Yeah. And then you start to get like the, the floral sort of notes in that. Mm -hmm. The, it does get, it's very familiar though. You can, you can't escape the sherry for a minute. Yeah, no, without a doubt. And, uh, yeah. it, it was interesting when I, when I had this one yesterday, the, even the sherry influence that it had, which was clearly sherry, it was a little bit different than I'm used to. Um, after this, I pulled down the Anak, uh, 24 year old, cause that's a mix of X sherry, X bourbon cask. And yeah. that has a more classical style of sherry where you get a lot of those like dark fruits and dark chocolates mixed in with the with the uh, whiskey, and the, I don't necessarily get as much of that with the Glen Scotia 18. Um, not that that's a bad thing. I mean, that's why we love whiskey because of the diver diversity you can get in it. But um, it's just uh, something that it's a flavor profile or whiskey profile that uh, isn't as common, and that it's kind of will take me a little bit of time to kind of figure out. I like to call this sherry season light. Okay, yeah, that's a good way to describe uh, it. You know, because it's it's like. I, I mean, we don't know exactly the proportion of the sherry seasoning in this case. And with a lot of things like Balvini or McAllen and some of the others, you know, there's like that 80, 20 split or 90, yeah, yeah. 10, you kind of know that. And, you know, I think this is less than that. So I yeah. think it's like, I like to call it a sea sherry season light or your summer sherry seasoning. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's lighter and it's, it's not the same warmth you feel. The sherry spice doesn't hit you as much. So. Yeah, um, that's yeah. why I feel like it's a good one to start with. Yeah, no, I think that was a, a great choice to start off with, um, and I'm I'm glad you picked it because it was a bottle I hadn't opened yet. So you, you, anytime I'm encouraged to open new whiskey, that's a good thing because most of my <laughs> bottles behind me are closed, and uh, you know my, my in general I like to focus on like a subset of whiskeys at a time just so I can see the evolution and whatnot. So I'm a little slow to open new bottles that I get, but anytime I have the opportunity to make an excuse to open one, I'm I'm glad to take it. Uh, I have to say, I was impressed with the list you had opened. Um, yes, I, I'm it's, not, it's big. <laughs> I have made a rule for myself that I have to have five open because I used to be 20, 25 open. And so at any given time, I have like five or six open and I try to finish those before I go to another one. So what, you know, what, so are, your, what are your five open right now? Well, you have the three here. All right. right? Yep. And then I have the two bottles about Redwood Empire. Okay. Um, okay. You know, the, I think they're called Pipe Dream and a Grizzly Beast. Yeah. The, the Bottled and Bond. I have those two. So those are my top five right now. All right. All right. So, and then yeah. you, you basically just uh, kind of taste through those uh, throughout the weeks and, you know, get to know them. I do. And, and I think the reason I do that is because for Whiskey Stories, I'm planning so, like, we plan six months in advance that yeah. I'm tasting so many of those to get them ready for our experience. And because I designed the menu with mm -hmm. our chef partners, I'm doing that on the side. So I feel like at home, I try to keep only five because I'm mm -hmm. prepping for Whiskey Stories so, so much. Yeah, no, that, that makes a, a lot yeah. of sense. Uh, and that's actually a good segue as we sip on our Glen Scotia for the first uh, the first few questions I have for you. Um, before we get into whiskey stories, just tell us a little bit how you got into whiskey in the first place. Like, what was your introduction into it, and how did it become a passion of yours? It's a bit of an accidental story. Um, mm -hmm. My first day in America, New York City, was 9-11. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, and I lived in, uh, I grew up in Cyprus. It's a Greek okay. island. Um, yeah. Um, you have some... We have some people from Israel and, and around Cyprus joining also and saying, hello, it's nice. Um, so, you know, at that point I had a job, I was on a work visa as a lot of immigrants are. And, um, you know, because of 9-11, I got laid off. It was this foot in the door. It was a small startup. And yeah. being on a work visa, um, they kept me for a month, even though they were closed down, they said, you can look for other jobs because if we let you go, you have to leave the country. So we'll keep you. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I was looking for other jobs and I found a job working with uh, Diageo as my client on okay. John Walker. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I was at the time I was 25 years old. I had not really thought about drinking whiskey living on a Greek Island. I was more of a wine drinker or mm -hmm. beer drinker, you know, and, um, when I started getting into whiskey, it was like the mothership had called me home. Yeah. 
And I was so fascinated by it, the stories, everything that I decided that I wanted to dig deeper. So it was kind of accidental and it was okay, I'm going to take this job because I need to stay in the country. Yeah, yeah. But then it was the best accident, you know, yeah. and um, I kept digging deeper and deeper. And then I also worked at Pernod Ricard. I worked at mm -hmm. Edrington. I was working on innovation which I got very lucky and mm -hmm. fortunate to get into innovation so quickly, you know, and so with that, it allowed me to really explore different parts of the whiskey, not only from liquid prototyping, I'm also a writer. So on the side too, I would do mm -hmm. conceptual writing. So all of that is where I started in whiskey. Yeah. All right. That's, that's really cool. And, um, uh, where, how did that like transition from your initial passion to, actually starting Whiskey Stories. How old is Whiskey Stories and how did you come up with the idea for it? Uh, Whiskey Stories is eight years old. Okay. Um, I started it in March of 2014. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you know, I parallel passed um, my, when I was working at Edrington and um, when I started working at Edrington, I was at a crossroad where I had just lost my father mm. and, you know, my father was an entrepreneur. He was completely himself and I was kind of searching yeah for for lack of a better word uh meaning and a way to grieve and so i started um looking at all different things that make me me and i yeah. realized that i really wanted to explore something and create something that was my own you know yeah. and um so i parallel passed all the things that i wanted to do satire writing comedy mm -hmm. performing acting and whiskey stories and it evolved over time, yeah. you know, and so it was a lot of work because I had a full-time job and I was doing that. And I went full-time with Whiskey Stories about four years ago. Okay. That's really cool. For sure. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. You know, and, and so it, this, what you see today, immersive, multi-sensory, didn't happen overnight because back in 2014, when I started doing an immersive experience, people said, what is that? But mm -hmm. immersive is such a buzzword now. Yeah. And everyone's adding it. You know, every day Secret NYC is talking about this is an immersive experience. Go to the Van Gogh. And yeah. That's, there's yep. all these different things, you know. But in those days, people would just look at me like, what are you talking about? You know? And so, but the reason I wanted to create that is I felt that because I was also working in innovation, mm -hmm. is that I felt like either there are some very dogmatic ways in which people are told to like whiskey yeah and that because that way is so old it lacks diversity it yeah. lacks inclusivity so you know um and the palette part the way they would talk about pairings was based on history that came from things like scotland or mm -hmm. old you know traditionally the u.s and again it lacked diversity yeah, yeah. and not all palettes are created equal so a south asian palette is very different from a middle eastern palette and you know i was born in the middle east i grew up in cyprus i had a japanese influence in my home and i was very lucky to have experienced all that and, and said okay well this is meant to cater to a specific upbringing and palette yeah and whiskey is so much more versatile and broader than that you know yeah. so that's why I wanted to create something that was broad perspective and mm -hmm. also multi-sensory. I have a sensory science background and, you know, storytelling and, and, and food, flight, uh, you know, fragrance, texture, color, mm -hmm. and even comedy and stories, all of those things actually help your palate because yeah. they help with emotion. So I wanted to create something that's very cohesive for every part takes you down a flavor journey mm -hmm. because let's face it at the end of the day people want to learn how to drink whiskey the distillery stories are great the mm -hmm. history is great but what they really feel they lack and what i would get all the time is i don't know how to drink whiskey yeah. and appreciate it so my focus is on that flavor journey and i use storytelling comedy you know our whiskey in the dark product and mm -hmm. all the different things to help enhance that journey in a way you'll remember it yeah, no, and that's that's a, a really cool thing about it is that, you know, whiskey itself is a, a journey on its own. You know, you have the 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 smell, the flavor, the, the viscosity, the, the feel of it in your mouth and everything. And 
and you're right it's a very it can be a very intimidating thing to kind of go into especially as a novice drinker you're used to wines you're used to beer something that's a lot lower and easier on the palate uh and it kind of seems like whiskey stories takes those individual components that is ne- that's kind of needed to enjoy a whiskey and like brings it into life and helps you understand why it's important to appreciate this aspect of it and that aspect of, mm-hmm. of it and that's that's a really cool concept and idea that you don't you. that you don't see anywhere else um and I mean, so much, and just the whiskey itself, like you said, so much of it, there is a there is a history and a story behind it, which makes it much better. Uh, Corai, uh, Whiskey Monsters, asking what we're both drinking right now. Yes. We are sharing the Glen Scotia 18. It's our first pour of the night. Um, and then we're going to go to the, to the Springbank 10 and then cap it off with the Magic Cask. Um, but... Um, uh, it, but yeah, I mean, the this, the history behind uh, of whiskey in general, it adds so much to the kind of the romance of it. So that that's such a cool concept that you have. Um, Thank you. But the one question I do have, and maybe this has to go with um, your idea of trying to, trying to approach it in a different way. Uh, you know, most whiskey enthusiasts, we always like to have a tulip-shaped glass like a Glencairn. I notice that you don't use this style of glass. Is there a reason why you don't use a tulip glass? Yes, I do that deliberately because, um, you know, when, so because I'm very proud of the fact that people get, I get 50-50. I get people who are aficionados, um, enthusiasts, really dig deep into it. And then I get those who are not necessarily, I, I like to call them curious. Yes. Whiskey curious, you know, because I generally don't get people who don't like whiskey. That just doesn't happen because I dig so deep. Yeah. And it, you know, in general, my company doesn't really attract those who don't, are not interested at all. Yeah. So one of the favorite things I used to do these, everything you see, I've, I've fine tuned over time, you know, cause we're 2000 plus experiences in. Yeah. So I keep evolving and fine tuning. And what I found is those who were aficionados, they would get this and look very serious and stick their nose in. And it was almost like, let's undo that for a yeah. second and try different techniques Yeah, because yeah. there are different nosing techniques. And a lot of people would think when I get one of these, there's only one way for me to do it. So you'll see in pictures, a lot of people's heads are tilted. So I, I take them to a slightly different method, you know? And so the people who are the other side of that, who are curious, relaxes them a little bit. Yeah. Also, depending on what kind of whiskeys I introduce, depending on the proof, that the whiskey glasses that I had, they're custom created for us mm-hmm. um, because I'm such a whiskey nerd. You know, the, the gold piping you see is the same color as a copper pot still. I'm such yeah. a nerd. But, no, that's awesome. Uh, really cool. <laughs> and so, you know, with something like that, with the broader top, yeah. it allows me to take them through the, some of the multisensory techniques that I've created. Mm -hmm. with that so that they can try the different things sometimes in the middle i will kind of bring these sometimes yeah and i would say okay let's see now that you've been through my way of doing things for the first two whiskeys let's see how this works and then we might bring that in so i sometimes do that as well yeah yeah that's that's great i i definitely encourage people to try whiskey in different glasses like you said it does provide it the two the identical whiskey mm-hmm. in two different glasses can provide a completely different experience exactly. and it's exactly. yeah and i mean it's important to kind of as you enhance your palate and your journey and your experiences through whiskey it is always good to kind of switch up the glass and that is a cool concept that you you go into and, and approach that whiskey with um do you have like a favorite uh event that you do for or whiskey stories like a favorite pairing like what's your your go-to uh experience well that's a little hard to say because, you know, because I have so many themes, right? And they're yeah. like my babies. So I love them all equally. And no two experiences are alike. So even though I might repeat the theme, the whiskeys are not. Mm-hmm. Um, even if I might repeat a couple, the others will be different. Or um, they'll be, um, the food pairings will be different. So no two experiences are alike. alike. Yeah. Um, just letting you know, it says live video paused up top. Is that um. Right? Mine says live on the top, so I'm not really sure what uh, what that is. But as, as long as you can hear me, I guess, and you know, we'll see if I, if I, yes. if we see anybody else join, we we should be live, hopefully. So uh, it says there's five people viewing, you know, right now, Lee. So uh, hopefully we're still live. Yes. 
hopefully people who are watching, you can see both of us and you don't just see Tim talking to himself. Oh, yeah, could you imagine that? Yeah, because it says live video paused on top. All right. Uh, well, we have a test case right now. My wife just signed in, and we can have her message me to see if she can see and hear both of us. Um, yes. The, the video stopped for me for a bit, but looking good right now. Single Malt Russell tells us. Thank you. Yes. Single Malt Thank Russell. You. All right. Thank so. Thank you. Yes. Um, but I have to say my absolute favorite creation is Whiskey in the Dark. Okay. That's also a registered trademark. It's a 60-minute blindfold journey. I've actually used Whiskey in the, in the Dark to train McCallum brand ambassadors. Oh, that's really I cool. remember a couple years ago, they brought me in, and they brought 25 of their global ambassadors, and I took them through the process. It was featured on Bloomberg News, so it's my pride and joy, you know, and... Um, the thing about whiskey in the dark is it's the unexpected part of multisensory. It's sensory deprivation, or as I like to call it, actually, sensory enhancement. Yeah. And yeah. so whiskey in the dark, people love it. And that's the one that people from all over the U.S. come specifically for that. And it's such an honor when people will say, I'm visiting New York City. You're on my list. So we all the other themes, I change it up a bit. And. I, I introduce at least two or three new themes a year, but Whiskey in the Dark happens every month because it sells out so quickly. Like yeah. we're already almost sold out till October for Whiskey in the Dark, right. you know? So, um, so that's the reason for that is, you know, the Whiskey in the Dark, obviously it enhances your under other senses. Mm -hmm. So it brings in that feeling of, oh, I can really taste this, you know? And, without being burdened by what other people are thinking and, you know, being self-conscious of what's happening, people are freer. So they mm -hmm. experience, they say more things and it's actually very relaxing for those who might be uh, earlier on in their journey than let's say a whiskey aficionado. Cause they are, sometimes you'll see the ones who are whiskey, whiskey aficionado. Sometimes people will wait for them to say something. Yeah, And then they'll say something and I try to make everybody feel comfortable. So I make yeah. a lot of jokes. I use my stand up training to kind of get them all relaxed, you know, and yeah. so uh, with the whiskey in the dark, that's the beauty. It was a silver lining that people, regardless of where their journey is, they, uh, they love it, you know, yeah. so um, I really like that. And it gets messy. People drop food. It's <laughs> great. You know, it's like, they feel like, you know, in the best way, they feel so free. free. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's really great. Yeah, yeah the, it, it should, whiskey shouldn't be taken so seriously all the time, mm -hmm. so it's a good way to kind of let go, have fun, and relax. So that does sound like yeah. a cool experience. I'm, I'm going to have to, at some point, actually go to Whiskey Stories and experience some of these uh, it, myself. Um, it, for, for somebody who, ha who has... Uh, uh, a, ba a background in whiskey, the enthusiasts is uh, is whiskey in the dark the one you'd recommend, or is there another event that you would have that you would cater more towards the enthusiasts? So great question. Um, the reason I have different themes is they're actually meant to target different target markets, mm -hmm. and um, you know, so it depends on where they are on their journey. So, for example, my experiences which are whiskey and mac and cheese pairing or whiskey and whiskey infused donuts you get people who come to those who are fairly early on in their journey and mm -hmm. the mac and cheese or the donuts is comfort food yeah so it makes them feel at ease so i allow that to come in you know it's not like the mac and cheese or, or whiskey and whiskey infused donuts all you get is mac and cheese or donuts yeah. you get other things but that is like the anchor and it makes them feel comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. But then things like Japanese versus Scotch saga, whiskey in the dark, mm -hmm. uh, flavors of Asia, you get people who are more aficionados okay. and they've been doing this for a while, right? Yeah. And so that is where I usually recommend if somebody says, you know, I'm bringing a group of six people and they're all aficionados, which you recommend. And I usually say that. Yeah. And then I have a separate one, which has the comedy pairings, mm -hmm. you know, and that's my theater background. I'm an actor on the side. I'm a satire writer. So mm -hmm. I script them. It's all scripted in house and it's truly immersive where they sit with you yeah. and we have our own actors, you know, yeah. there are resident actors. And so 
it's partially scripted by me, it's partially scripted by them, and then the rest is improvised. Yeah. Those are for community building. Mm -hmm. All right. So there you get 50 and 50, and that's aficionados trying to see whiskey in a different way. Because I have a very unique method with the comedy, where the comedy is fun, but they don't realize they're learning. So there's a proprietary method there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then for those who are new to it, they just relax, right? And it's, so they learn a new way to do it. Yeah. And so the comedy is also where you get a lot of people saying, oh, it's my birthday. Mm -hmm. It's my wedding anniversary. I got promoted. I want to laugh, you know? Yeah. And so things like that, you get a lot of those coming in, you know, or it's the holidays and I want something. So the community building is the one where you usually get with the, with the comedy aspect of it. Yeah, and that's that's a really cool, uh, j just a cool way to integrate whiskey into some other type of uh, themes and, and whatnot, uh, which is, you know, that's something that I, I can sort of relate to. Like when I do these weekly uh, whiskey lives or these you know, Instagram live streams uh, talking about whiskey, whiskey's always the backdrop, but I'm slowly trying to branch out into having guests that aren't necessarily whiskey enthusiasts but more whiskey curious and we talk a little bit about their specialty or their backgrounds um and in a, in a similar fashion i mean pairing whiskey with comedy may not seem necessarily like they go hand in hand but it just kind of works it all you know whiskey's like a great uniter and it can kind of pair with so many different yeah. aspects and uh creative thought and the thing is you know i've had eight years to fine-tune it yeah when i will fully admit in all transparency when i first started I call it mall mentality. And what I mean by that is like food court mentality where each, yeah. each place is its own thing and they're kind of disjointed, right? Yeah. They don't, the mall has a lot of shops, but it's not like they collectively work together. Yeah. They're each doing their own thing. So when I first started eight years ago, I threw put in the comedy and it was like its own thing. Then I yeah. did, we have, you know, our, even our music lyrics are created in house because yeah. we are have musicians. And so, the music was there and then that was kind of disjointed, right? Yeah. So now it's everything ties in to tell a story. And so yeah. I look at the four whiskeys as four acts in a play. Yeah. Like they each build on the previous one. So lineup matters, the actors matter, the characters matter and everything. They're even scripted in, in the way they're saying things. It mm -hmm. actually helps you with your journey. Yeah. They have catchphrases and all that. And that didn't happen overnight. You know, mm -hmm. I developed that with time. Yeah, yeah. And I cool. fine tune that. And so it's at a place where it's not just comedy for comedy's sake, right? Yeah. I call it comedy with a purpose. Uh -huh. You know, ooh, cute. cute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, our dog's barking downstairs. <laughs> but uh, but no, that, that makes a lot of sense. You want to have some sort of... Uh, or uh, some relationship between the two and how they can build on each other and and coexist in in a world and you know my belief is that whiskey is the great enhancer it can it makes conversations better it can make experiences better if you respect it and you enjoy it and whatnot um so that's that's really cool uh it's i'll have to dm you uh after this conversation and uh get your recommendation for when a, a good opportunity for me to go down there and experience one of these and i can bring some of my bottles for for us to share post show so that'd be that'd be kind of cool um absolutely all right so any last comments on the glen scotia 18 before we move on to the spring bank 10 i think as we're having fun with it it's getting less sweet mm -hmm. and yeah. it's getting more floral did you t feel that at all uh yeah as it said since my my bottle in particular is a little closed off since i just opened it yesterday and as it sat in the glass uh it did kind of settle down a little bit uh and got a little yeah. bit more refined so I, I i agree with that for sure yeah um it also depends on the year do you know by any chance which year of your glen scotia it is well i bought i well, actually has it on the back um it yeah. was was um let's see here uh february 25th 2020 so it is uh two years old mine is 2000, 2013 oh wow so yours is significantly uh yeah. older from a much different vintage so i'd be curious to see the you know that would be an interesting side by side how has the glen scotia 18 yes. evolved over the last seven years I will say that I served, you know, I have an experience called Lost Distilleries. It's yeah. one of my favorite topics. So uh, I do a lot of Campbelltown in that. And mm -hmm. um, I recently served the Glens Gorshea 2020 18. And mm -hmm. it's not as sweet as this. Okay. Um, this is really sweet. I think yeah. the sherry is, I think it's 
the percentage has probably gotten less over time, which isn't surprising for most yeah. whiskeys. That's the case. Um, but I think that this one's way sweeter, at least yeah. for my palate. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't uh, picture the Glen Scotia 18, at least the one I have, as something that's overly sweet. You know, that's not my impressions with it. So that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, uh, are you ready to jump to the Springbank 10? Yes, I am. So, uh, what are your what are your general thoughts on the Springbank 10? I personally, this is one of my absolute favorites. It's one huh. of my go tos, you know. And the reason is it it has everything. It's mm -hmm. it's oily, it's peaty, but medium peat, you know. Yeah. It's it's got that that brown sugar honey dew sort of you know happening, and then it has also the. I feel it tastes a little bit like oral gray tea. Oh, yeah. And then the sweet sweetness to me, actually, if you let it breathe, tastes like an Indian gulab jamun. I yeah, I so, wouldn't I wouldn't know what that tastes like. <laughs> so to me, sometimes this is like two in one, where I'm having the tea and the gulab jamun together. You know, so I like that about this as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. No. Definitely. And and Springbank. In particular, they their batch variance is a little bit more significant than others. Uh, mine is from 2021, so mine's a, a fairly recent batch of Springbank. Um, uh, mine is, oh, mine is also 2021. All right, perfect. I guess we picked them up around the same time. Yes, so, exactly. Um, and, and, of course, Springbank is one of those uh, whiskeys that are becoming harder and harder to find these days because of the, the craze in the U.K. It's a little bit easier in the U.S., but they're a lot more expensive in the U.S. just at retail. Um, but it's like the allocated bourbon market right now in the U.K. I mean, you have almost no shot at getting one of their more interesting releases of any of their three brands. Very true. I have to say, based on the list you sent me, mm -hmm. you have a nice, respectable impressive collection there yeah yeah i have uh uh well it just it, with springbank or with everything i mean overall absolutely but springbank you had a nice range that was open and yeah, i was so, quite yeah yeah i so. i i got into springbank uh you know pretty early on in my whiskey journey so I, I when i first got into it it was easy to pick up all of their interesting bottles you know they stayed in in the and i usually order from the uk because it was a lot more affordable so I would have no problems going on to some of my favorite whiskey shops and just adding it to the car and, and buying it. Sometimes I could get duplicates um, without, you know, feeling like I'm taking it away from anybody. But those days are long gone. So any, the, over the last year, any of the special releases, I just haven't been able to get my hands on. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, you can see behind me, I've got a lot of the Long Row Reds. I've got the uh, Springbank 17 Madeira cask. Um, a couple of those Hazelburn Oloroso sherry casts, which are some of my favorite whiskeys of all time. Yes, me too. Those are just those are so good. Um, and now I'm running into the the uh, the conflict of I know how much these things are selling for on on, uh, <laughs> on auction, and I'm not trying to sell them by any means. I've never really bought whiskey to flip them, uh, but it's hard for me to justify. Like you know, I've got a Springbank 21 that'll sell for five, six, seven hundred dollars on auction. How can I justify opening this bottle? You know, and it's not like I can sell it easily in the US anyways, but it's always like that conflict. It's like, huh, this is just not gonna live up to its its hype and its uh, stature right now. Even though Springbank is my personal favorite distillery. I love everything they have they make. Yes. Um it's still, you know, it's it's a challenge nowadays. I think um for someone like you is such a passionate bottle collector i think cask mm -hmm. investment is a better thing for you because it's yeah. kind of, it'll sleep at the distillery you know mm -hmm. and you won't have to see it every day so you know we have um one of so we have three tiers to my business there are the experiences we have our whiskey based luxury unisex cologne line yeah. and that's part of the experience that we sell them separately and then we have a members only vip club where i showcase people how to invest in whiskey and so we do have a group in there where there's such avid collectors of bottles that i just feel like drink them unless mm -hmm. it's like you know something that's like ten thousand dollars or something then maybe <laughs> yes maybe you put it in a in a vault or something but for them it's like i think cask investment is a better, better yeah no i agree in the long run yeah for sure the, yeah. the cast investment makes a lot more sense unless especially if you are 
looking to you know build some value in that. Um, and I never bought these bottles behind me with, ever without the intention of, oh, I'm going to save these for a decade and, and sell, resell them later. I always just assumed, like, I'll eventually get to them, I'll open them and drink them. But then, you know, sometimes distilleries, they just take off in popularity and the demand goes crazy. And all of a sudden you're, yeah. hold, you're holding on to these assets. The, the, they're basically assets over drinking experience because the value that they're worth is not gonna the, the whiskey inside just can't live up to it you know an eight hundred dollar whiskey would have to be something pretty profound to be worth eight hundred dollars um and as much as i love Springbank, most of their whiskeys aren't aren't worth that at that price tag at least in my opinion and the thing about it you know is that a, a whiskey that price usually has nothing to do with taste yeah it's you fine know, yeah no without a you doubt. know I've worked on, on whiskeys that are, you know, where they were released at $100. They're now worth 2500 And I mm -hmm. know, having tasted them, that they're not yeah. the best in, you know, in the lineup. But it's less to do with that. And, you know, whiskey investing is like investing in art, you know. Mm -hmm. And so the name behind it, the yep. history, things like that is, has is nothing to do with the taste, you know. So that's where I feel like. If there's a whiskey you really like and you have it and even unless it's like like i said there is a threshold if it's like ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars maybe resist <laughs> yeah but if not do your do your thing you know but if it's even if it's an 800 dollar bottle and you love it yeah yeah you it's it, drink it. It, yeah i mean at the end of the day whiskey is meant to be drunk so uh i yeah, i do still plan on opening all these spring banks over time i might have to wait for uh, perceived special occasion before I get there, but no, I agree. There, you know, uh, early on or you know, novice whiskey drinkers, you, they can be swayed by a high price tag, and that'll influence what they perceive as a good whiskey or not. Uh, but the further in your whiskey journey you go, the more you can kind of separate yourself from the price. I mean, I've had sixty dollar bottles of whiskeys that were significantly better than a hundred and fifty or two hundred dollar bottles of whiskey. I mean, it just really depends on the cast makeup, the cast maturation. Like a a good, a good example of that is. The uh, Glen Alecky 10-year-old uh, cast strength versions, batch Yay. five, six, those ones that are like rich with the the uh, Oloroso Sherry and the Virgin Oak with the Rio Haas casts and all that stuff. It's a beautiful blend of rich, delicious whiskey for like 65, 70 bucks. That is tough to uh, replicate. Um, and the value is just ridiculously good. Even the Spring Bank 10, even though it's gotten pricey over the last couple of years, yeah. for for about 80 bucks, which is roughly which what I can get this at. I don't know what it's like down in Brooklyn. Uh, this is easily worth it. I mean, this is it's hard to get a whiskey that is this interesting and unique. You know, I get my Spring Bank 10 in Jersey because where I live in Brooklyn Heights, it's $120. Oh, that is so, pricey. Yeah, is and pricey. depending on where you are, if you go like to Bay Ridge and further out, you know, and I actually have a go-to place in Coney Island where okay. you can get it for $80. And yeah. so I either will go all the way to Coney Island or I will go, you know, my sister lives in Jersey, so South Jersey. So I yeah. will go to the buy right by them. Yeah. And sometimes you have things there, you know. So, for example, one of my favorite, all-time favorites, in all transparency, I am biased. I worked on the McAllen, you know. Um, but, and I, I was part of the innovation team, so... But I, one of my all-time go-to favorites is the is the McAllen Classic Cut 2017. Oh yeah, and, I've heard about that one. Yeah, and it's 115 proof. It's a work of art, and you know there are people who are buying cases across the world to, as an investment, and um, it is something that I am saving as an investment. But I have to always have a bottle open, no matter yeah. how pricey it gets, you know, because I love it so much. Yeah. That, that's like one of those things where uh, it's just such a great, great whiskey that mm -hmm. I feel like as much as I can, Spring Bank 10 is going to be like that for me. Yeah, yeah, same you here. Know? Yep, definitely, without a doubt. And McAllen is actually one of the few distilleries I haven't explored a ton because, you know, I usually go after value whiskey. I'll, I don't know. Springbank has me hooked already, so I, I'm already lost with them. But for everybody else, um, I look for value whiskeys, and it's just hard for me to justify any of the McAllen prices right now. And clearly, they my, I'm not their target market. They, they are targeting the more affluent uh, clients that are looking more for the image more so than the whiskey experience and not that it's going to be a bad whiskey experience in my opinion it's still going to be good whiskey but it's not necessarily the, the you know the enthusiasts whiskey um at least that's my perception of McAllen and their marketing scheme i think it depends, them, 
Um, well, I think, I think you have, you have a fair point. I think that that's, uh, you know, I'm in a different place because I worked there and yeah, I was so yeah. immersed in it. Right. Yeah. But the difference is it depends on which one you choose. Right. Mm. Yeah. And I do feel like, yes, it's for the affluent, but it's also for someone who, um, you know, isn't always looking for that discovery because it's a well-known yeah you know within mccown there are some that are less well-known and yes the discovery comes in but i think just given your collection yeah i can see someone like you or someone like me digging deeper with everything else there yeah. because whiskey is such a broad story to tell mm -hmm. so it doesn't mean that mccallan you know isn't the one to go to and actually i left before they opened the new distillery so i want to mm -hmm. see the new distillery because it's been you know it's it looks very impressive from the pictures and yeah. the sustainability part of it is very interesting so i want to see that yeah but i agree like you know campbell town i just i'm such a big you know explorer in the lost distillery and you know mm -hmm. i've really geeked out on that and dug deep into how the lost distillery started in japan mm -hmm. and asia and it kind of took over and then that whole thing you know and so i have other places that i would like to visit too yeah yeah without a doubt actually i'm i'm going to campbelltown at the end of august so i'm Very pumped cool. to that we're doing the the full uh barley to bottle tour which is the whole day mm -hmm. thing where you get to blend your own bottle at the end so that that'll be cool um but uh but yeah i mean mccallan you know I, it has its place in the marketplace without a doubt i don't i early on in my whiskey influencing i would uh you know i would uh, bash mccallan a little bit but over time i've kind of outgrown that i'm like no you know what mccallan has its place um and it, they do they do good make good whiskey and you know there's so much out there that there's a market for everybody so it's you just have to be open-minded to Absolutely. it Absolutely. Um, and you know they, it has such a history like i, I have a mccallan 18 from 1996. oh wow and, that's uh, yeah that's and a that of and that is a work of art you know yeah. and uh it's just that is um it's like heaven in a bottle you know the, yeah. and like like i said the classic cut 2017 is incredible so there's this is a debate that we could have and i I think someone said McAllen has entered the chat, which made it interesting as well, you know, so yeah. that's always cool to see that. Um, mm -hmm. But there's a lot going on, you know, I have been focused on the Indian single malt market mm -hmm. because it is growing rapidly. Yeah, definitely. You know, and there's so much happening there that I'm really excited for that. You know? Yeah, so without... Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I haven't delved too much into Indian whiskey. I've had a, a few pours of uh, Paul John, I want to say. Is that the John? Mm -hmm. Paul John. Um, but uh, outside of that, I haven't gone too deep into it. Although that's definitely something. It's not because I, I don't want to. It's just, you know, I'm still busy kind of exploring Scotch whiskey for the most part. But uh, that is a very interesting market. It's a, a unique take on whiskey. And they're making some great stuff too. So that is definitely a market worth keeping an eye on. Um, so I do have a few uh, whiskey based questions for you just kind of like your what your preferences are and so on um, uh, do you prefer scotch or bourbon I'm, I'm assuming scotch but I figured I'd just ask it's funny there's a few people saying I would have thought Omar is um, Middle Eastern and not Taiwanese I was born in Kuwait in the Middle East so my mind always goes to uh, Middle East also yeah. I, you know so it's an interesting name Oh, someone brought up the Solist line. Yes, yeah. Cavalan Solist is amazing. Yeah, I've had I've only had one sample of uh, Cavalan Solist, but it was it was very rich and it was an excellent excellent whiskey. It's lovely, and the Sauternes yeah. cask too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, those are great as well. Um, uh, I'm sorry, you asked me a question: bourbon versus Scotch. Yeah, what's your preference, Scotch or bourbon? You know, it depends on the brand. It's so hard to pick one. It depends, you know, like for scotch, it depends on which brand it is. So I don't think one is better than the other. They're so different. And, yeah. you know, with bourbon also with people, my go-tos usually are high rye bourbons. All right. I love a good high rye bourbon. And my best value for money, which I think you won't be surprised about is is an old forester high rye bourbon you can't mm -hmm. beat that it's so well done you know but yeah. then 
like the red bird empire i like it because they experiment with high rye bourbons you know and i yeah. really like that um i wasn't born in the u.s but so i can't run for president but i always say like if i could one of the first things i would do is insist that all bourbons be high rye bourbons and yeah. ban, and ban grab, groundhog day because i feel bad for the groundhog yeah. uh you know so those are i have my priorities straight but yeah. um you know, so I tend to love high rye bourbons. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think that that's more complex. It's more um, versatile. Mm -hmm. And so I like that. You know, I tend to not go for 100% corn, even though one of my favorite American whiskeys is Belkanis. Mm -hmm. Even then, I tend to, I like their single malts. Yeah. Um, I tend to like a high rye bourbon. And so... It's so different, right? And mm -hmm. then in, in Scotch, it really depends on what. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at my jokes. You know, guys, the more you drink, the funnier I get. So no pressure. <laughs> uh, but you know, with, with with Scotch, though, I have an interesting mix there because you know it's interesting that we also have blended Scotch today with the Magic Cask. You know, and I'm very, I am a Again, in all transparency, I used to work in Highland Park. I helped build um, some Highland Parks, you know, like Highland Park Magnus and things like that. But I love Highland Park. Yeah. It's one of my go-tos. And I just think that it's, again, a whiskey that's done beautifully. It's got a beautiful story. And then the peat with this cherry, it's really well done. I really like that, you know. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on what I'm looking to do, what kind of experience yeah, I definitely. am experiencing. Yeah, uh, without so, doubt. Someone's asking us what we think about high wheat bourbon type. What are your thoughts on that? Um, so I mean, uh, I assume they're talking like Maker's Mark or Larceny. Um, I enjoy them. Um, you know, I I haven't had Weller's before because I'm not looking to pay that much money for uh, a bourbon. Um, but uh, I do enjoy Maker's Mark. Their cast strength, Maker's Mark, is one of the best values in bourbon, I think, because you can get like a liter for like 40 bucks, which is insane, um, for a pretty good high wheat bourbon. Uh, but for me, bourbon's a little tricky. Um, I don't notice as much difference from one bourbon to the next as I would in a scotch whiskey. Um, so uh, I do, I mean, I can tell when I'm drinking a more weeded bourbon versus a high rye bourbon, but um it's the the characteristics are very similar for me but um you know i guess my my general opinion is that i i enjoy the high wheat bourbons um you know as much as any others it really depends um on the proportion of bourbon i'm mm -hmm. sorry wheat mm -hmm. the proportion of wheat and the proof yeah yeah because i've seen on um, whiskeys because you know everything is while we have whiskey in the dark where it's blindfold journey in general we don't reveal the whiskeys beforehand you mm -hmm. know they don't know what they're drinking and hands down whenever i introduce a high proof weeded bourbon mm -hmm. people will insist it's a rye mm -hmm. that's interesting you that's know? very interesting and so the reason for that is because you know if you get a wheat whiskey like an old yeah. elk hundred percent wheat whiskey yeah and it's high proof. People will insist it's a it's a rye, yeah. because it tastes spicy, and because we yeah. as a grain is so light that they're tasting the oak spice and they yeah. don't realize it. So that's the difference that I see in the proof when you play with a weeded bourbon and a proof and yeah. the proof. Some people insist it's a high rye bourbon. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. I I've never had yeah. that experience. I do know that when I do drink a bourbon, it basically needs to be barrel proof because when it's too low, especially in bourbon, if it's too low in ABV, it's just a little too one dimensional. It's just that sweet, uh, you know, caramel vanilla ness that's just kind of, uh, takes kind of a singular form. So I do like the high, the high proof ones. Um, but you know, for me, rye has a very distinct, like fennel, uh, taste notes to it. Like I, I can usually pick it out, but that would be interesting to try in a, in a blind uh, lineup because uh, I'm not super versed in bourbon. So um, I would be curious to see if I would think that there was a lot of rye in that bourbon too. Um, but I, I, I feel like I wouldn't, but I, I don't actually know. That would be, that'd be a cool kind of uh, experiment to, to try out. And, and you know, it's, it's also interesting because people have 
Firstly, people will say things like, oh, I like whiskey, I don't like bourbon. And then you have to tell them, okay, bourbon is a type of whiskey. Yeah, yeah. And because of the sweetness of the corn, they think it's separate. Yeah. And it took me forever to figure that out. I would think, why do people not know that? It's because of the sweetness and the syrupiness, right? Yeah. And then also, bourbon used to be a lot more complex before prohibition, right? Mm -hmm. So because of that, and then because bottled and bond actually brought so many standards, mm -hmm. bottled and bond is slowly coming back. So I think, you know, someone also asked, I think it's our wonderful friend Russell, who said, what about American single malts? You know, is that bourbon is a high proof, high rye, bourbons are coming back and mm -hmm. i think that that is where you might start to feel like okay there is a discerning side to this you know yeah. and and you know and i think that once prohibition stopped people needed to make money yeah and so they introduced a bourbon that was easier to drink it was more mm -hmm. palatable it had less rye in it you know yeah. and so with that it kind of got lost in there in that history where it became more palatable and people got this impression that Oh, it's too sweet. It's too caramely. It's too, it's too, you know, and with a lot of craft distilleries that source from Indiana MPG, mm -hmm. there's a lot of that smoothness that comes in, you know? And so there's a little bit of that going on as well, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, um, someone is saying, I'm going to try a bunch of high proof bourbons on July 4th yeah. and then go back to Scotch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you know, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, I, I do like the barrel proof bur bourbons. I do recommend uh, try Elijah Craig barrel proof if you can find it. Yes. For, for me, that's like the, if especially, you know, before the prices get too high, it's like the, the perfect combination of value, delicious whiskey, and just a great one to try. Um, that, that one's worth seeking out, but you know, it's, uh, I'm glad that, uh, he is looking, uh, to go from scotch to bourbon because it is so hard for me to convert bourbon drinkers into scotch drinkers. Bur mm -hmm. You know, the bourbon drinkers love their sweet, bold drinks. And I, anytime I try to introduce them to like rich, well, actually, uh, VA bourbon hunter right here, Damon, uh, last week, he was my test case. He's a strictly bourbon drinker and, uh, I sent him five cash strength scotches and one, one Irish whiskey and, uh, I tried to convert him. I think I was three for five. So I was semi successful. Nice. So yeah. So yeah, scotch to bourbon. <laughs> Um, well, you know what? I think you and and Bourbon Hunter should come to Whiskey Series, and I think I think uh, we'll co together we'll convert him. All I right, think that's, it makes, yes. I, I, I think need it, I need help. I need help yes, converting him to Scotch. I think so. I think you know because I've done it. You know, okay. it takes more than one try. I will say that because I've had the same person who insisted on Bourbon come at least three times at Whiskey Series, and then I got there. So I think together we'll we'll. It with full of love, Bourbon Hunter. We'll gang up on you, and we'll, I think yes. we'll do it. We'll do it. Absolutely. It depends Absolutely. on the scotch. It, it depends on the scotch. It does. It does. I, I sent him five very different types of cast strength whiskeys, uh, just to kind of gauge. And yeah, the Open Twelve cast strength was his uh, his favorite of the group. I sent him. So now I have an understanding of the flavor profile he he'd be after. So that's you know we chipped him away two more attempts, and I think he's gonna trade in all of his bourbon for the scotch whiskey. That's the goal, at least. So I won't reveal to Bourbon Hunter what I'll give him right. if, he, if he visits. But for you, Tim, I think you should try Redwood Empire Bottled and Bond. Yeah, I've never had that before. So that's something I need to, I definitely need to seek out and, and try a sample of uh, and just kind of explore um, bourbons a little bit more myself because it's something I do, you know, I don't go after too much. He's like, don't, don't go so far. All right, all right. You can uh, maybe not trade in the bourbon uh, collection, but add a few a few bottles of scotch. You know, as long as we get one or two in there, maybe we'll uh, we'll call that a success. Um, and single malt Russell is recommending Tobermory. Um, that's something that I, I actually I love Lechik, but I have yet to have a Tobermory. I have a bottle of their twelve year old. I haven't opened it yet. Um, so that's that's the distillery that I need to explore a little bit more. So. Um, I can't, I, I don't know whether to recommend that one or not. Turbo Mary 12 is great. It's, yeah. It's great. Um, but I, I'm not sure it would convince someone who's just such a hardcore yeah. bourbon uh, drinker, 
but yeah. I think it's it's great. Or Tobin Mary Twelve is yeah, great. yeah. No, and when, uh, the 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 uh, scotches I sent him, I sent him the Open Twelve. I've heard from other people that to convert a bourbon drinker, send them a cash strength sherry whiskey. Um, but then he told me, then he told me he doesn't like sherry. So I was like, damn it, that's that might not work. Um, and it's and, it tur- and the the sherry ones I sent him were slightly peated, and he did not like the peat at all. So some people love peat, some people hate it. He happened to hate it, so that was the failure. But I think I think we can you know slowly chip away at the the bourbon wall. I think for someone like that, you need to. Um have a transition whiskey mm-hmm. you know like uh someone is suggesting take him on a journey i was just gonna say this uh he's they're saying use japanese whiskey and then go to scotch mm-hmm. uh and that that's a great idea i also think that the journey needs to be american single malt mm-hmm. um, yeah that's, that's what I would, I would recommend that and and then Another step in between that I won't reveal, because then he'll come with preconceived notions. You yeah. become a topic of discussion. And- yeah, yeah. He didn't know what he was coming into. Uh, he just yeah. ha- he entered the conversation at the right time. But uh, another one, another style of whiskey that I f- I associate closely with bourbon is cast strength Irish whiskey. So I've got a bottle of the Redbreast twelve year old cast strength, and that one is a much closer flavor profile to a bourbon more so probably than a scotch and he actually said that was the ones i sent him he said that in a blind tasting he might think that was a bourbon so that would be kind of one of those steps to kind of get him towards the so single too. pastel single malts um if you like red breast past you're gonna love uh the new glendalough mizanara all right I'm, yeah i'm in love with it it's so good um it's so well done you know um i was impressed yeah, you know, I was a little skeptical at first, but I really like the new Glendalough. Yeah, no, Red, Red Breast has definitely opened my eyes to Irish whiskey. It got me into Teeling, which uh, if you've explored any Teelings, those are so good. Uh, I've got some of their uh, 18-year-old Renaissance casts, which are just so beautifully... They're, they're just phenomenal whiskeys, the, the way that they made those. Um, and I haven't had that st- that that brand yet, so... Uh, that's one you'll you'll have to send me a DM or something of how to spell that so I can actually seek that one out because my my Irish shelf I probably need to kind of expand. A Absolutely, <laughs> Glendalough is great. Um, they yeah. have, I think you, did you say your wife is a gin drinker? Uh, my wife is a what? Gin drinker? No, no, she's more of a wine drinker. My wife okay. is than a gin and drinker. Maybe I, I I'm mistaking it for something else because Glendalough has uh, beautiful gins as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, I will definitely, definitely. Yeah. Um, or if anybody knows, can I type it in here? Yes. Uh, yes. You, yeah, I'm not sure. I've, I've uh, never tried yeah, to comment yeah. in my own uh, live streams before. Um, there we go. Oh, perfect. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know that brand. Yeah, I've not, I haven't had any yet, but that's one I will uh, definitely seek out. Uh, somebody else, uh, they're, they're recommending the Aberlauer Abuna, which is uh, which could convert people to scotch or to bourbon from scotch bourbon scotch um and i you know normally i would probably say yeah that might be that might work but for this particular uh person we're talking about he mentioned he doesn't like sherry to influence uh whiskey so that may not work but i do love the the abuna i've only had one bottle i think it was batch 49 it was an excellent excellent whiskey um but uh though that price has kind of creeped up to the point where it's kind of outside my my price range for a non-age statement um though it's it's uh one that i've i'll always uh hold closely for sure (laughs) <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, I uh, do have a, a few other questions, uh, just a curiosities. Uh, if you had to pick just one distillery as your favorite, one distillery, you can't can't pick more than one, which one would you pin as like, oh, this is my favorite? Oh my God, that's such a hard question. Why are you doing that to me? Sight sick <laughs> I know. Well, sh- should we pour the third one uh, to, you know? Like, maybe... Sure. All right, let's, let's jump into the third one before you answer that. I'll give you a minute to think about it. Um, and uh, you mentioned lost distilleries. I guess this is probably a lost distillery in the sense that it no longer exists uh this is mostly uh imperial uh i think it's 20 20 20 uh 22 year old imperial and like eight percent uh i'm pretty sure a four-year-old craig Allicky, i think is the other component it says a uh, distillery by apple hour on their website but i think i stopped in a compass box live stream once and the uh host mentioned that the distillery by apple hour was actually craig Allicky. so I think that's what the other portion is. So it's four-year-old Craig Allicky. Um, and again, Imperial, 
uh, stopped production in 98, demolished in uh, 2013. So the whiskey we drink here, will will once it's gone, it's gone forever, never to be created again. Absolutely. Also, you know, I'm just excited that it doesn't have Klein Leash on it. Uh, are you not a fan of Klein Leash? No, no, no. That's, that's, uh, I am, but so many of Compass Box whiskeys have Klein Leash. They do. Yeah, they, they love their Klein Leash as a blend. Um, and I, you know, I understand why, because the waxy creaminess of a Klein Leash pairs so, like, uh, just yesterday, one of my favorite Compass Boxes, their no name number one, it's 75% yes. Ardbeg. And then it's got like 10%, like 15 year old Klein Leash. And it just got, it just enhances everything. It's just such a wonderful addition to it. But to your point, Compass Box does lean into that Klein Leash and Dell you in quite a bit. Yes. Um, the, the Imperial is so, is an awesome direction to take. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. I'm not I don't sure. Know. I I'm like it. Sure. I really like Magic Cask, and I think it's very, it's quite different from what they normally do. Yes, I know. agree. So, I really like it. And also, the thing is, when you go through a journey of the two we've tried with this, what I feel like, because your palate gets prepped for sweetness, mm -hmm. when you have like I've done this before at yeah. Winter is when you know lineup matters. So mm -hmm. when you do magic cask third or fourth in, what ends up happening is you start tasting some of their fruitier notes. Yeah. In it, then if you start the magic cask, then people mm -hmm. think it's quite harsh. Yeah. When they start with it. So I I rarely introduce it. You know, yeah. No, no, for you know, I 100% agree. I mean, the order is essential in any whiskey lineup. And something that's a little bit more nuanced and subtle might might not be detectable as your first pour, as your palate's getting acclimated to that high ABV. I usually almost always start with like a very a low ABV, simple like ex-bourbon whiskey just to prep my palate. Um, and I do the same when I, whenever I'm going through a whiskey tasting with, uh, you know, anybody who, who's drinking with me. Uh, I'll always prep it with something low ABV, ex-bourbon, light, won't saturate the palate too much, but it'll acclimate it to the high ABV. So then each subsequent pour will have that much more, exp you'll get that much more out of it. Um, so yeah, uh, Magic Cast is, yeah, having a second or third in the lineup is definitely the way to go. Absolutely. Uh, you have a nice evening too. We got... Uh, uh, yes. Thank you. Be signing off. I, I don't know how to pronounce your handle, so I'm not even going to try. SC. <laughs> S.C. Nolois, we'll call it. Yes, thank you so much for joining yes. and engaging. Absolutely. But yeah, no, this is a, this is a really nice whiskey. Mm-hmm. My, my, I'm gonna, I'll, in full disclosure, my pal, I'm, I'm only having small pores today. My palate was, is a bit saturated. Um, I had a friend over last night and we tasted, by the end of the night, and just, just small, like, splashes, we went through about 13 different whiskeys. So my palate's still kind of recovering from the uh, the too much consumption last night. Um, so I'm not I'm not I'm not experiencing this in its full uh, glory uh, in today's tasting. Um, but you've had some time. Uh, did you think of where your number your the one distillery that if you only could go to one or to taste one ever again, which one are you going with? I would say Nika in Japan. Hmm. So in other words, Ben Nevis, right? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on what you're trying. If you can yeah. be their own baby, but yes, yeah. that's that's funny. You just, it's a good thing we're not thirteen whiskeys in because I would have laughed so much at that, uh, <laughs> you know. And uh, but it's just, you know, I have a big Japanese influence in my home. My dad mm -hmm. worked for a Japanese company. Um, I have a couple of paintings at home which were which used to sit in in. A Japanese distillery that no longer exists. He was given them, so in his memory, I got 
you know, my dad's paintings. And yeah. so, and then just the story of Mika Kakatsu mm -hmm. is one of my favorite whiskey stories, you know, the fact that it took him 20 years to get mm -hmm. me out, that's, that's your life's calling. That's your legacy calling, you know? Oh, that, yeah. You know, and the fact that, yes, he did learn from Scotch. It's, there's so much of that. When you go to Japan and you go to their distilleries, you know, you see so much of that influence. And then the fact mm -hmm. that, you know, Japan is one of those places where they just seamlessly work with tradition and technology together. They just know how to yeah. blend the two together that, I just love that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and speaking of the lost distilleries, I mean, he learned his trade from the no longer existing Hazelburn Distillery that Springbank <laughs> rebranded later. So that's exactly. the, it. Adds to the story and the the uh, intrigue of the whole the whole thing. And um, actually, the very first bottle that I bought to really start my whiskey journey was the Nika whiskey from the barrel. Um, I went to a liquor store with my buddy, and he was into whiskey. I I was like, nah, I don't, I don't think I'm gonna like whiskey. Um, and I'm like, all right, if I buy, I'm going to, I'm going to buy a, an affordable bottle. If I don't like it, you have to buy it back for me. Like it's going to be yours. Um, and then, you know, I obviously ended up liking that. And from there I started buying just bottle after bottle after bottle. And then the rest is history. So I do, uh, have Nika does hold a special place in my, my whiskey journey without a doubt. Do you, do you know which bottle, like which singular bottle kind of kicked you off? I'm like, oh, wow, this is, this is different. Which bottle was that? Um, it was the, I think it was the, um, the pure malt Takatsuri edition. Okay. Um, and it's lovely. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they've had some of the others, like the, the Yochi and the Muggy Q. They've got the specific versions, but they have the Takatsuri anniversary one. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that pure malt. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the Nika of the Barrel from the Barrel now, because of the new laws, mm -hmm. um, Oh, my kitty, my kitty just jumped. Did you see yeah, that? Yeah, your cat made an appearance. <laughs> yes, he's so shy. I'm impressed that he came in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> my dog, my, I have a German Shepherd. She has a play date, so she's not yeah. there. All right. Um, but he's been sleeping under the couch pretty much all day, so mm -hmm. I'm surprised, Yeah. you know, that he came out. He's very shy, so... <laughs> Well, the the whiskey audience is uh, feels honored that. Uh, what's your cast name? Malcolm. Malcolm made an appearance, so thank you, Malcolm, for yes. joining the live stream. This is Malcolm H. <laughs> My last name is Hukmani, so I call yeah. him Malcolm H. Can you see him? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, we can see him. Okay. <laughs> um. Usually, if he feels like he doesn't have my attention, he makes an appearance, but he's very shy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I guess. You know. uh, you're, he's probably thinking you're drinking a little too much whiskey for the night. It's almost time to wrap that up. So yeah, you know, it's understandable. Also, he, you know, he's shy by by morning, brave by evening. So the sun is setting, so he's getting braver. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so funny. Definitely. Um, someone's saying Takatsuru seventeen and twenty one are uh, sublime. So the Takatsuru that I'm talking about is the twenty one. Um, okay. Thank you for the segue. I was just about to say that. I got distracted by the little kitty baby. <laughs> um, so, you know, and the thing about it is is that Takatsu created Yamazaki. So yeah. the world wasn't ready for that. And Yamazaki is very similar to Scott, right? So yeah. I love the journey he took to, to get to Nika. So when you get, when you visit Nika, you feel the energy of the history you know, and also the fact that if it wasn't for his wife believing in him, mm -hmm. you know, Nika would probably not have even existed. I just like the energy of the team effort there. So, yeah, um, I think when you go to the distillery, you kind of feel that, you know, and so yeah, yeah. as the, the storyteller in me gravitates towards that. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a product of love, which is great. And, um, you know, and that, and I mean, the story behind the whiskey makes it so much better to enjoy when you hear the history and the story. And then the whiskey itself is kind of like a time capsule of all those years that just so it stood or uh, sat waiting in those barrels. Everything that's ha changed, the whole atmosphere that it kind of absorbs throughout those X number of years that it's aging. It's just the whole th the whole concept and the idea of it just enhances the whole experience. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, do you, you can see the, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. He's, he's 
he's giving me this guilt look. Oh yeah, he's uh, telling you it's you know he's maybe he's hungry. He's ready to uh, he's ready to to, yes. to to have your full attention. But we'll get you out of here shortly. I've got two more questions for you, and then we'll let you uh, we'll let you attend to the, to, to Malcolm H. Um, uh, what what's your favorite cask type for Scotch maturation? Mm, very great, good question. Um, I mean, the obvious question is a, the obvious answer is like a a Pedro a PX okay. or Arresto because that's so easy. It's so easy mm -hmm. to do. But um, you know, I think you do you mean cask finish or cask aging? Either one, cask Either match one. Full, full maturation or a finish. Mm. That's an interesting one. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to need some time with that one because right. I feel like the sherry seasoning is such an obvious one and it's been done so many times. But, yeah. you know, I, I do like a Bordeaux finish. Yeah, yeah. I do like that because I think – and then – there was a couple that I've tried with Zinfandel finish, which I really mm. like. So I like the, the wine finish yeah, as well, it. you know. I really think that that's great. Um, yeah, now speaking of uh, Bordeaux finish, I think it's somewhere back here. But maybe it's very too deep in the shelf. Um, have you ever had the uh, Deanston 2008 mm. Bordeaux red wine matured? This is like a just like a hidden gem among the the whiskey yeah. shelves. It, it's it was like sixty five ish dollars, and it just provides that that bright red fruits that you get from the wine cask influence is just tremendous. Yeah. It, that that is an example of a red wine matured whiskey done right. I've had you know I've had a long row red that was you know those are matured obviously in red wine casks, and the red wine kind of flattened out the the good characteristics of the Springbank distillate. Um, so I thought it was a like detraction from mm. the whiskey. But when a red wine's done right, it, it, those can make some phenomenal whiskeys for sure. Absolutely, and I think it's something unexpected. Mm -hmm. You know, I I think just. Um, from a standpoint of where it's from, whether it's it's mm -hmm. heated or not, you know, I, I really like, I tend to think a, a wine Bordeaux finish is too light. It needs to be mm -hmm. cask aging. So yeah. the sherry, although it's obvious in the, in the seasoning way, like a PX, I really, I, li I like that. But I think from an aging. Yeah. A Bordeaux is great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, I know you know sometimes these fancy ca uh, cast types that they kind of enhance and, and uh, make a whiskey more complex. But if you can get a like a just a simple hogshead, well aged uh, hogshead matured whiskey, sometimes those are just really tough to beat. I've got a uh, Del Yuen twenty three year old aged and mm. ex bourbon hogshead. And the, like, the tropical fruits and the creaminess that comes out of that whiskey is just, it's second to none. I mean, when you get, when it's done right, you know, it's just very hard to beat that maturation. And I mean, also, if you do a cognac, it's, it's quite, it's really, oh, yeah. really awesome, you know. And depending yeah, on where definitely. it's from, you know, I like the smoky aging with cognac because I think that that really works. Yeah, yeah, you definitely. know. Yeah, I think the, the yeah, and I really like smoky with like a pork cast finish too. Yeah, exactly. maturation, you know, it, it adds that extra level because peat can, can be kind of dominating. Mm -hmm. So when you have a cask influence that kind of complements that dominant flavor, it can really be a standout. The Cavalier and Concertmaster, the port wine is beautiful. Right? Yeah, it, you yeah. can't go wrong with that. Um, no. Someone is saying uh, from Australia, a nice Pinot cask finish. It's N A N T Nant. Yeah, I've never, I've never had Nant. I have not tried that yet. Yeah, yeah, I, I feel like thank I've, I've heard it. Yeah, thank you yeah. for the recommendation, without a doubt. Yes, we we'll like to look into that as well. Yeah, yes, there are a lot of whiskeys out there to uh, try. So it looks like you just had your last sip of the, the Magic Cask. Any last thoughts on on that one? Um, I have quite a bit left. Oh, um, okay. All right, so that was a different whiskey. Yeah. Um, I, I had my last sip of the Magic Cask and. Uh, <laughs> With time in the glass, it, the the sweetness kind of came out. I, I enjoyed it. My last two sips, it really kind of came together for me. So 
I, I'm a fan of this, and I can't wait to kind of explore it more as I as I drink and share the, the rest of the bottle um, over the next X number of months. Um, all right. The so, interesting thing. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. The interesting thing about Magic Cast is um, I feel that as I spend time with it, it tastes more earthy to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, um, I. So. I, yeah, I. Uh, the first time I had it, I got a lot of like peanutty type fl- uh, profile to it, um, and that was very interesting. I, I really enjoyed that that aspect of it. It has like a like a. Almost like a, like an, an oily, raspberry sort of taste to it. Like yeah. it, it's got that very, you know, and an almond and, and those type mm-hmm. of things together. So I really like that it's very versatile. So the more mm-hmm. time you spend with it, it gets more nutty, mm-hmm. you know, and it tastes more malty, of course. Yeah. Um, but I really, really like that about it, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mean, you know, the... the the thing I just love about Compass Box is that their releases are just so unique and interesting. Yesterday, yeah. along with opening the Glen Scotia 18, I opened up a couple of entry-level Compass Box uh, expressions. I had their Oak Cross, which I'd never had before, but I know it's discontinued now, so I was like, all right, let's give this one a shot, see how good it is. And that was a really nice, easy sipper, and like you mentioned earlier, is mostly Klein Leash with some Delu in, so they're two go-tos. And then I opened up their new entry level expression, their Orchard House, and that one is just such a nice, easy sipping, yeah. sweet whiskey. For the, and the price is right on par, like you know, it's perfect, perfectly priced. Uh, and both of them just really delivered in their unique blend. I mean, John Glazer knows what he's doing when he's uh, blending these whiskeys. I mean, Orchard l- literally tastes like apples. Like it's, yeah, it's it so really does. lovely. Yeah. And it's, it's like, you know, no matter where you are in a whiskey journey, it tastes like apples, you know, it's yeah. just really, really great, you know? And so one of the things I love about that is, is that when I, I've included it a couple of times at Whiskey Stories and people will just say, they get so excited because they get the apples hands down, you know? Yes. And so it's like a sense of accomplishment for them. So I don't know if they meant to do that, but if they did, it's, it's a really great yeah you know like pat yourself on the back for knowing that flavor profile well i have to given its name orchard house i have to assume that was their intention uh and it and he hits the nail on the head too and it's such an approachable whiskey it's it's almost like the quintessential perfect whiskey for a beginner because they you can really tell them what you you know it's obvious what you're smelling what you're tasting and then also it it transcends novice too like you said even with the the enthusiast can enjoy it because it still has enough intrigue it's it it might be a little might be a little one-dimensional but it's such a well-made whiskey it doesn't even matter it's exactly what it's supposed to be and in that in that sense it's it's perfect absolutely we have uh, say hello to my pleaded friend join us. Hi, he's come to Whiskey Stories before. Yeah, yeah, I just met him for the first time. Uh, he's lovely. Igor. Yes, yes. Uh, we uh, we went to a Cuddy Sark event down in uh, New York City um, a couple of weeks ago. So I met him for the first time. That was cool. Hopefully, we uh, can meet up in person, do some whiskey tastings together. We discussed uh, how we're gonna share samples uh, going down the road. So that <laughs> that'll be cool. That'll be cool for sure. Um, I used to work. In- yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, uh, I, you know, I actually haven't actually sipped any Cuddy Sark yet. I got a little, uh, a little vial of their new 12, out, uh, 12 year old release, but, um, it's still a whiskey I haven't explored much, but that's kind of a more entry level blend that, uh, mm-hmm. has just kind of eluded me to this point, but it's something I'm sure I'll enjoy once I get around to it. Um, the Cuddy Pro, the Cuddy Prohibition is, is, you know, the 100 proof, mm-hmm. that is where, I think if you're looking to explore, that's where you want to go, or if you can get some of the vintage ones, but with yeah. these, the aid statements, I think that's where you want to go. You know, mm-hmm. just the yellow label is, it is Boring. what it is. Yeah. It is yeah. what it is. Um, you know, it's, it's your entry level. It's easy to drink. It's the put in the whiskey punch, you know, it's that mm-hmm. kind of thing. It's a good blending whiskey for sure. Yeah, exactly. Or, you know, it's fun to experiment, but if you want to do your own whiskey aging, like I, one time I did, the Cuddy Sark yellow label green bottle mm-hmm. in a, an ex Tabasco barrel because I was just curious. That's interesting. That is interesting. Uh, because I wanted to see how it went. And, you know, it, it almost brought like a rye type feel to it, but it did add a complexity to it. That was, yeah. you know, it was a happy accident because I feel like something like that can go horribly wrong. Yeah. Um, you know, but 
But that was an interesting one. So I think that's a good whiskey, whiskey to like experiment with. Yeah, know. yeah, without a doubt. And I, you know, I try not to be too like snooty when it comes to whiskey. You know, obviously I drink a lot of you know expensive, interesting whiskeys. But even the thirty dollar bottles, I find can be enjoyable like monkey shoulder or naked grouse those are all enjoyable whiskeys to me i usually find something to like in, in most whiskeys I, I don't i don't think there's many like <laughs> legit bad whiskeys out there so um but anyways i'm gonna get you out of here on this last question um since it's getting a little late here uh if you had to if you could share a dram of whiskey with four famous people dead or alive which four people are you choosing wow Amazing. Um, dead or alive, right? All right. Uh, dead or alive, yeah. Did you say dead or alive? Okay. Dead or alive, um, either, either or. Let's break it down the middle. Let's say two alive, two dead. Okay. Um, I would love to share a dram with, with uh, President Obama. Oh, yeah. That, that, that would that be would fun. Be, absolutely. I think, I don't know if he drinks, I did meet him once. Oh, that's really cool. Which is that's, really that's fun. Really I used to cool. live yeah. in D.C. Yeah. And I run my first ha half marathon. And there's this Irish pub in D.C. that's like the go-to. And he asked for, I think he asked for a Jameson. Mm -hmm. It was, it was right. St. Patrick's Day. And he asked for a Jameson. And he asked for a extra large t-shirt at mm -hmm. the bar because they were giving out uh, St. Patty's Day t-shirts. Uh, so I would love to drink whiskey with him because he was there when I ran my first half marathon. That's, that's awesome. That's really cool. It would cool. be fun to see what he thinks of other Irish whiskeys or, you know, yeah. just, um, um, the other person that I think I would have loved to share whiskey with is Betty White. Oh, that would be really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think she would have some great stories of her own to share. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be really great. Right. Yeah, and I feel like uh, she would be somebody who would enjoy a, a good whiskey. She, they, she struck me as that kind of woman. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, then um, from the Indian side, you know, I, you may not be familiar with uh, people who are Indian would know this. She was a very famous um, backup singer in Bollywood. I don't know if you're mm -hmm. familiar with Bollywood, but we used I mean, to I know what it is, but I'm not familiar with the, uh, the actresses and actors and whatnot. So... Um, Backup singing and yeah. lip syncing was a big thing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So Lata Mangeshkar, who is mm -hmm. a big uh, icon in the yeah. Indian world, I would love to share a dram. I don't know if she drank. I don't know. Yeah. Well, um, that's, that's your job to kind of introduce them to the wonders of whiskey, right? So yes. you try to introduce them. Exactly. But she was such an icon that, and she was such yeah. a trailblazer, you mm -hmm. know, building this, this, this amazing career that it would be really, really amazing to have yeah, her. Um, absolutely. And, you know, um, does it, does the last person have to be famous? It doesn't have to be, no. You can, okay. you can have a family member in there or a friend. I would choose my dad. Yeah. Because yeah. he never got to see Whiskey Stories in action. Mm -hmm. He passed away just before. He yeah, inspired it. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, I inherited his decanters. I have his decanters here. When you come to Whiskey Series, you see decanters at every table because in yeah. his memory, he was a big decanter collector. So yeah. I would want, and he was an entrepreneur mm -hmm. at heart. He was yeah. a self-made man. You know, he financed his sister's wedding when he was 14. Yes. So that's, that's incredible. Yeah. Thank you. So I would love to share a dram with him and, yeah. you know, say that they can't, don't worry about us, it works out. Because he would always yeah. worry about his kids as unmarried yeah. children. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that, no, that's, that's wonderful. And, you know, we, ha we have to do a cheers to, to your dad without a doubt. Thank so you. cheers to him. Thank you. Um, but that does, that sounds like a great, I'm surprised you actually didn't pick uh, for one of your spots, uh, the Nika founder. I'm surprised he, he didn't add, make it into your final four, but uh, I do like that table. That sounds like a, a, a wonderful table to have. Um, you know, if you'd given me five. <laughs> Maybe he would slip in. There, you know, but, and, and it's one of those things where um, I think it's just the state of the world. I, I think 
the President Obama one was a little unexpected, but I think just the state of the world I'm in, I'm kind of looking for someone who, you know, <laughs> you know, for lack of a better word, I'm just going to leave it there. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah. you know, but uh, yeah, it was a toss up with that. Uh, and also, I think that I like Takatsu so much. Yeah. That I just feel like, you know, and we've, we've had Takatsu as a character at Whiskey yeah. Story so much. Yeah. That I think that he's already there. <laughs> yeah. So he's already, yeah, he's, he's already built into the consciousness of your, your uh, whole experience. So that's really cool. Um, Thank you. But, Thank you. but no, that does sound like a wonderful table to, to be at. I'm sure the conversation would be engaging and, and insightful without a doubt. Um, but uh uh, it's, it's getting late here, so I'm going to sign off here. I really appreciate you taking the time to join me tonight. Um, you know, I, I'm looking forward to going down to Brooklyn, going to Whiskey Stories, and experiencing one of your many um, experiences. I'll, I'll leave it for you. I'll let you know when I have some free time, and unless you decide what, you know, which one would be the best for my experience level, and I'll make time to go down there and, and try to bring a, a whiskey-loving friend with me to, to enjoy the experience with. Absolutely, and you know, um, bring your wife. I know she's a wine drinker, but yeah, yeah, I need. We'll see, take care of it. Yeah, she is one of the the, uh, the my hardest uh, converts. You know, she'll snows it, she enjoys it, she'll have a sip on occasion, but I've yet to kind of get her pulled fully into the whiskey world. So maybe your experience would be that one uh, push she needs to kind of get into the to the whiskey drinking world. I get women like uh, people like that all the time. Mm -hmm. So what has she got to lose? Exactly. Just exactly. So yeah. Yeah, without a doubt, we'll, my wife and I will go down to Brooklyn. We're only an hour away, so it's not a, <laughs> not a far drive for us. So we'll, we'll definitely do that. So I'll be in touch offline to figure out when the best time to go down there would be. Oh, my Absolutely. wife is saying what? She, she's uh, responding to 100 right there. So And yes. that's our dog. You can see in the little icon that you were barking earlier. Absolutely. So. We would love to have you. I think when your wife's coming, I think we do the comedy, one of the comedy ones. Yeah, absolutely. So she's got, she's got other things going on. She'll love the cologne pairings. She'll love the food yes. pairings. The blindfolds will be fun. And, and you know, there's so much there for her. And if, and if she feels like, I'm not sure about this whiskey, um, we do uh, offer things like, cocktail all right version yeah version cocktail because you know actually this is really a, a funny thing but we get a lot of women who are expecting come to whiskey stories and they want to experience oh, yeah. the whole thing minus the alcohol drinking so yeah. I, cr I create virgin cocktail infusions for them and so we'll yeah. have those on the yeah. side as backup so if she feels like she want to mix she wants to mix a little bit we can do that yeah, no, absolutely. That sounds like a lot of fun. And uh, if, yeah. you know, if there are any whiskey th that you saw in my long list that I sent you, they're like, hey, I want to try that. Let me know. And then like be before the show or after it, we can have a few, a few extra pours and you can, we can try out some new whiskey. <laughs> absolutely. All right. So thanks again. Lucky. No, that sounds great. Uh, so I'll, I'll be in touch uh, offline. Uh, thanks again for jo uh, joining me tonight. And I hope you have a, a good rest of your night with uh, Malcolm H. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, the, the German Shepherd Wolf will be coming in here every any minute. So <laughs> your right. timing is perfect because when she goes on her play dates, as it were, she is crazy. So thank you so much yeah. for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this was so we'll much fun. Yes, that, thank you again. Have a good night. You too. Take care. Take care. 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 care.